This video is supported by Raycon. A while back I did a video on four mysterious deaths and disappearances, but as many astute viewers may have pointed out, I dropped a little mystery at the very beginning of the video. The mystery of the missing story. Uh, because at the beginning I said this. When putting together a video of mysterious disappearances, there are a million options to choose from, many of which you guys have sent to me over the years, but the five that I picked here... The five that I picked here... So yeah, that, that video went long, and then we wound up cutting one of the stories for a time, but it was interesting enough to carry its own video. So that's what I'm doing here today, but just to set this up real quick, you know, they, they say that truth can be stranger than fiction. Uh, I don't know if this is necessarily stranger than fiction, but it certainly sounds like fiction. Like, I, I can't believe this hasn't been made into a movie. But anyway, with no further ado, I bring you the mysterious death of Rodney Marks. Antarctica is home to no one. Or maybe it's better to say it's home to everyone. Because of the Antarctic Treaty, the continent is open for all countries to perform scientific experiments and no military action is allowed there. There are around 70 seasonal or year-round stations representing 29 countries around the world and they study everything from geology to biology to astronomy. The U.S. keeps three stations going year-round and has the most personnel in Antarctica than any other country in the world and the most famous of these stations is the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station. No relation. Edmondson Scott was built in 1956 and it specializes in astronomy and astrophysics due to its excellent optics down there at the South Pole, but also because they have a neutrino detector. One of the researchers that was stationed down there was a 32-year-old Australian named Rodney Marks. Rodney was described as a free-spirited, bearded, six-foot-two scientist who liked to paint his fingernails black and color his hair purple. He had an interest in math and science from a very young age and he wound up getting a PhD from the University of New South Wales in astronomy. So he was stationed in Edmonton Scott in the year 2000 to work on the Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and things seemed to be going well for him. He had just gotten engaged, he played guitar in a metal band, he was popular and social around the station. He was settling in to overwinter there, winter being made of August down around the South Pole. But on May 11th, he started getting sick. He visited the station's doctor, Robert Thompson, on three different occasions, each time feeling more pain and anxiety and shortness of breath. From there, he became disoriented and eventually had cardiac arrest and was pronounced dead on May 12th. Thompson told the rest of the crew that he had died of unknown natural causes. Now, because of the brutal Antarctic winter, uh, his body couldn't be flown out, so it was actually put on storage until October before it was finally sent to Christchurch, New Zealand, eventually on its way to Australia. But it was in Christchurch where a forensic pathologist came to some shocking news about Marx. Apparently, he was in perfect health but he died from complications from consuming around 150 milliliters of methanol. As you can imagine, this raised a lot of questions. Did Marx commit suicide? Did it happen by accident? Could somebody have poisoned him? Methanol was kept at the station to clean the telescope's cryogenic parts, which took place in January, so it had been in storage ever since then and locked away. So Detective Grant Wormald from New Zealand began to investigate the case, and he came to four possible conclusions. Suicide, recreation, accident, or somebody spiked a drink. Suicide was quickly ruled out because Marx had a lot of things going on really well for him. The research was going well. He just gotten engaged. He had a long career ahead of him, you know? There were no warning signs in that direction whatsoever. And besides, he went to the doctor three different times. That's not something you do if you're trying to kill yourself. Recreational ingestion was considered because he was known as a, a heavy drinker. Um, he also had Tourette's. It was thought that maybe he might have drinking more to cope with his Tourette syndromes, but the station had a well-stocked bar. There was no reason for him to resort to drinking methanol. And as far as accidentally drinking it, it was clearly labeled as poison and locked away in a cabinet. Like there's no way he could have just accidentally had it not knowing what it was, which goes back to the whole suicide thing that was ruled out. So that only leaves one more option. And as Dr. Wormald concluded in his report, quote, in my view, it's most likely Dr. Marks ingested the methanol unknowingly. That means he was poisoned by someone. If this is true, this would make Rodney Marks the first and only person murdered at the South Pole. And whoever did it got away with it. How is this not a movie? There were only 49 people there. They were completely snowed in. Nobody was getting in or out. It's a whodunit set at the South Pole. It's Clue meets the thing. But yeah, the New Zealand police weren't able to solve this case. They actually placed some of the blame at the feet of the United States National Science Foundation, who runs our Antarctic programs down there. They say that they weren't very forthcoming with information. The NSF 
denies this claim. But there is some weird stuff about this. The NSF sent questionnaires to all 49 people that worked with Marx at the time, and out of those 49 people, only 13 responded with answers. And that Dr. Thompson guy, nobody seems to know where he is now. Could it be that being cooped up in isolation for long periods of time can make a person go a little nuts? It definitely played a part in an attempted murder at the Russian station in 2018 when an engineer seemed to have kind of had a mental breakdown and stabbed a welder in the chest. Uh, the welder actually survived and eventually forgave the guy. But anyway, all jokes aside, it is a tragedy and it's a very weird case. He, maybe he was murdered. Maybe he just did something crazy out of sheer boredom. We may never know, but that's what makes it a compelling mystery. Okay, so actually after looking into this a little bit further, after I recorded the previous bit, I did run into some reports that apparently Rodney kept his desk notoriously messy and did keep around on his desk cans of methanol and ethanol and stuff like that. And they think that he may have just kind of gotten drunk and Darwin awarded himself accidentally, but this does contradict reports that other people have said that all the methanol in the station was locked away in a safe place. Others say that he arrived at the South Pole Station with this weird exotic Portuguese liquor that he bought in New Zealand and there was some speculation that it might have been some, you know, back alley kind of thing and it was tainted in some way. And apparently the South Pole Station had a still where they made moonshine. And in the first runnings of moonshine it actually does produce some methanol and it's thought that maybe he might have uh, consumed some of that and got that methanol into a system that way. Watch out for that South Pole moonshine, kids. And just to confuse things further, there were also reports that he had injection marks in his arm, which could mean all kinds of things. Really, it seems the more you look into this case, the weirder it gets. And it's easy to go down the rabbit holes of the salacious details and kind of get all caught up in that. But when it all comes down to it, this is the tragic loss of a young man who had a long and prosperous life ahead of him and a family that has lost a loved one and are seeking closure. So let's hope that they get that. So hey, let me take a quick minute to say thanks to today's sponsor, Raycon Earbuds. So full disclosure, I've been looking for some new earbuds for a long time now. Um, I've actually I got these I've been trying to get rid of. I just threw away some a minute ago. I've always had trouble with earbuds that fit. Somehow these both hurt my ears and fall out of my ears at the same time. I mean, I was seriously considering spending like three or $400 on like super high-end custom fitted earbuds. Like that's how much trouble I've had with this. I was thinking about spending that much money. But then yeah, Raycon reached out and asked if I'd be willing to try out some of theirs and I said, uh, sure, why not? Yeah, I know, there's, there's some perks to what I do. But yeah, no, I've been trying these out for a little while and uh, I gotta say, they're, they're pretty great. I'm not like a product reviewer or anything, so I can't compare this to a bunch of other earbuds out there or anything, but no, I'm really happy with these. But no, I wear them when I go running, they stay fit, they sound great. The last earbud that I had, I was constantly adjusting them all the time. These, these stay put. Yeah, they have all these different sizes of these silicone ear inserts. I had to play around with them a little bit to figure out which was the right ones for me, but I found one that works, which has always been challenging for me. But no, they're super intuitive to control. Each one has a button on each side and you use that button to advance the song forward. You can do like two on the right side to go forward, two on the left side to go back. Volume works the same way with three taps. And they come in this cool, compact carrying case that charges them. You can charge it with a micro USB port in the back. And one of the really cool things about it is the second you open it up and you take them out, they immediately pair up with your phone. You don't have to do anything. It's just automatic. That's good to go. You can see the little charging things in there. You just snap it in. It connects magnetically. In this case, when you charge it up, it can hold six hours of battery life. Oh, they're discreet. They look good. They have all different kinds of colors. I like the black, but you know, do you, boo? This particular model is called the E25. They do have some fancier ones called the E55. These go for $79.99, but if you click the link in the description down below, you can get 15% off of that. Now, I was seriously considering spending three or four times as much for some earbuds because I've just had so much trouble with them and having them fit and the way they sound and everything. And uh, yeah, I'm not looking anymore. I like these, I'm keeping them. So yeah, if you're in the market for some fairly budget-friendly uh, earbuds, I can, I can definitely recommend these. So yeah, 15% off when you click the thing down in the description. So go check it out. And thanks again to Raycon for supporting this video. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. If you did, you might want to check out this video because Google thinks you'll like that one based on your viewing habits. There's other videos over here on the side if you're watching on your computer. Um, if you do watch those and you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week. Stay safe, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.